considering the fact that you're talking about character, I mean, doesn't public perception also play a critical role in this regard? Considering the fact that this same APC elements of winning Christ, which you, you, you often refer to them, uh, use the same or deploy the same public perception as a leather weapon uh, in 2015. You see, for me, my disappointment is more with the people who would be willing to embrace the delusional lies of the possibility of anything changing or improving if either Tinubu or his twin brother Atiku or Etiku should become the president. They are actually twin horsemen of the apocalypse. They are not different. They are the same. The ruling class has done us a wonderful favor. They've produced one candidate. Just as the two parties have become one, at least demonstrably so, they've also produced a single candidate. You can actually produce an identity kit that fits both. Both are criminal in nature and intent. Both have public records of extreme avarice and stealing. Both are integrity challenged. The difference is that we don't know the true name, age, and parentage of one. The other one at least has a credible story as to his provenance in the public space. So what you are actually seeing, you are looking at two dogs. One is a mongrel, the other is an Alsatian, but they are both dogs. So it's not like they have presented us, the species is the same. So it is up to Nigerians to look beyond those two, because frankly speaking, you will notice that I haven't spent much time on Atiku, because there is really nothing to say about him. He, is, he has sufficiently introduced himself. Obasanjo has done a fantastic job of defining him, so we already know him. But Inubu, because of his ownership of a lot of press levers, the purchase of the intellectual kaku makers, you find that he's not properly interrogated and people are dancing around the issues when they are talking about him because they've all fed from his table. Feeding from his table has meant that a lot of illusions have been allowed to travel and dispelled for too long. So when you are dealing with Inumbu, you are dealing with the falsehood of stories of the success story that Lagos is. What success story for heaven's sake? Now, let's also look beyond uh, Atiku. C clearly, you, I, mean, I, I read one of your recent tweets where you actually talked about the only plan he has is his corruption. I mean, uh, what about Obi, um, Peter Obi, for example? Now, Peter Obi has to actually uh, <laughs> garnered so much uh, in terms of followership, both on social media with seeing the upsurge in the, you know, the Southeasterners registering for voters. I mean, uh, is... Peter will be a force to be reckoned with as far as this election is concerned. It is up to Peter Obi to decide whether he's going to be a force to be reckoned with or one to be ignored, frankly speaking. I've had several engagements with uh, the obedient <laughs> crew, and I've sought to make something clear to them. If ever a candidate was made for a season, it is Peter Obi. But it is up to Peter Obi to now decide whether he wants to become what he flatters to be. He flatters to become, but he isn't. And this is very simple. Peter Obi has spoken, I've heard him speak extensively to the need to restructure Nigeria. But I have not heard him place concrete plans and ideas on the table as regards the restructuring of Nigeria. A lot of his obedient people would answer me and say, ah, if he says anything now, the North will not vote for him. They've already branded him an IPOB candidate. And I say to them, the difference between the leader and the followers is that the leader must first of all identify the destination and then persuade on the strength of his vision those who he wishes to have following him. But there are times, and we are in one of those times in Nigeria now, where we are actually in a leadership recruitment exercise. We are the ones who need to recruit our leaders. If our leaders 
are non-existent, and Nigeria has none. And Peter Obi has come out and is offering leadership qualities. He has proven himself in a state, even though there are people who challenge his records in Anambra, but it has traveled long enough for us to say that reasonably, he must have done well in Anambra. Now, if he has done well in Anambra and is coming to Nigeria, he must understand something. The primary issue with Nigeria is that it has been destroyed beyond repairs. Destroyed by the years of the PDP, yes, but the job of destroying it beyond repair happened under General Buhari. So if you are going to be able to preserve Nigeria, you have to actually reimagine Nigeria and then sell your new image of Nigeria to the Nigerians. Because it's a democracy, it's not going to be all Nigerians that you can sell your ideas to. But if you sell your ideas to sufficient numbers as to propel a movement for change, then you are a leader. You can talk about moving from consumption to production all you care. But if the structure of the country is not one that encourages production, because what it actually wants is to impoverish those who live in the space, how do you increase production? If he is not talking about restructuring now, and he is propelled into office on the basis of the illusions of Nigerians who are hoping that a Peter B presidency might change Nigeria, would he be exercising the powers of a military dictator, or how does he intend to work with this skilled National Assembly? The only way Peter B wins is if he is able to galvanize a national movement. The only way he can galvanize that is to listen to the pains and yearnings of at least a majority in four out of six geopolitical zones in this country. We desire to see Nigerians freed from the shackles of this fraudulent constitution. Why is it impossible if he knows, and he should know, he's intelligent enough to know that the critical problem with Nigeria today are its evil governance structures, which are rooted in the 1999 fraud, Decree 24. Why is it impossible for him to galvanize us behind his own vision of the future that is rooted in restructuring? You can't change anything without restructuring Nigeria. It's not possible. So where is his vision for restructuring? Omo Yelisho Ore has one. We know exactly how many regions Nigeria would become if the AAC wins power. We know exactly what his views are on state police. Is on paper. Why is it so difficult to ask this of Mr. Peter Obi? But some, some, some of your critics might say, or actually say, is that uh, if it's not, uh, do you think the Muslims northerners will allow the constitution to be redesigned to remove their advantages. You see, this is the first thing that pains me when these questions are asked. What advantages? Whose advantages? The only persons that Nigeria currently advantages are the ruin members of the ruining class. The people in Kankara, they are full and is. Zamfara is full and near and Ausa almost equally divided. The northeast, the Boronus and the, uh, uh, the, the, the Boronus and the Fulanese, and then a lot of minorities. Who is enjoying Nigeria the way it is? Why are we afraid to confront our problems with ideas because the ideas will be unpopular? Why? They might be unpopular. Yes, explain it to them. Speak to people in relatable terms. Is it that the man in the Northeast and the Northwest does not want good life for themselves and their children? Do they understand how the structural lopsidedness of Nigeria makes it impossible to develop infrastructure? Do they understand that once upon a time, the same country that had only four regions now has 36 states and a federal capital, each of which has a governor, a state house of assembly? Once upon a time, there were more local governments in the southern, in fact, Yoruba land, the west, 
add more local government than the whole of northern Nigeria because local governments were not the basis for sharing revenue. They were basis for locating development. And the Western region was interested in urbanizing and developing its space. So they created a lot of local government. But today, you create local government based on land mass, whether there are people there or not. These so-called advantages, how does it trickle down to the common man on the streets of northern Nigeria? These advantages are claimed in the names of Arewa, but it accrues only to members of their feudal ruling class. It has never percolated down to the people. Why is it that we are afraid to speak to ourselves? Because, you see, we have made it so easy for Nigeria to perpetrate lies, just to be lying. What northern Niger? Who are these northern Nigerians? Are the people of the Plateau, part of this northern Nigeria that does not want restructuring, the people in Bauchi, are they one of them as well? All those parts of Bauchi, the Tangali people, I, so they don't want this restructuring. The Jukuns and Taraba do not want this restructuring. Are they not in northern Nigeria as well? Who is northern Nigeria? Who exactly who are the northern? It is important that we dispel these myths by confronting the issues with truth. If the people in northern Nigeria don't like it, that does not hand them a veto over the rest of Nigeria that might want it. Just as the South cannot on its own gain power without the acquiescence of the North, the North cannot gain power without the acquiescence of the South. This is something, so at any point in time, we must all understand that the restructuring we are talking about is not meant to disadvantage anybody. It is meant to make life easy, easier for all of us. And just because one party is saying it doesn't want it does not mean that those of us who want it should give up on demanding what we believe to be right. We can have this disagreement. We can have this argument. But we must be able to agree on what the facts are, what the truths are. Then we can now begin to argue about opinions. Nigeria is not working. It is not working. It can't work the way it is, and it cannot work on the imperatives of an ethno religious block. It can't. It has to be a consensus of all. Now, help us reconcile this, because considering the fact that you say Nigerians cannot work under this, this present, um, you know, uh, structure, so to say, you know, fraud. Um, Time and time again in the past, you've always said that Nigeria's problem cannot be resolved by personnel change. In fact, you, it says, you, you, you said that the system has been designed with impunity on, on the garden it and can never deliver anything positive for Nigerians or to Nigerians. Now, how do we reconcile this fact by saying we cannot have, Nigeria's problems cannot be resolved through a personnel change, and now you are talking about having a change in the constitution. See, structure. Let me, I, I think sometimes we find it difficult to see the trees because of the forest. And I have this habit as well of trying my best to make sure that I don't do information overload. Yeah. So I tend to compartmentalize my arguments. Personnel changes will never save Nigeria, and I stand by that. But I also recognize that there are only two ways to change Nigeria. Electoral or war is one or the other. You are either going to change Nigeria using the electoral path, or you are going to change Nigeria by force of arms. I think it was my... Um, Tahir. But she, the man is Tahir. I think he's the Taliban Bauchi. He was the leader of the northern delegation to the 2014 conference. He said something I have always pondered. He said, if you want to change the 1999 constitution, you should go and, plot a, go and plan a coup. Hmm. <clears throat> he said it. At the time, it sounded in awkward because this was back in 2014. 14. It didn't really resonate. But in recent times, the more I've pondered it, the more I've come to realize that what the man is saying is essentially true. You are going to have to plan a coup. 
<clears throat> and in this case, what I'm actually advocating is a coup in a different way. I have believed and I have said so unapologetically. The Nigeria cannot be saved in the absence of a revolution. And I've also been careful to explain what I mean by a revolution. A revolution simply means a turn around. I've explained it ad nauseum. It comes from the French word revolve, turn around. If Nigeria does not turn around, it will die. That is a fact. But however, how do you turn around a system that is logged into the path of destruction if you say that it is also not a democracy. That's why I said there are two ways, your PVC or your gun. The PVC offers us a chance. There is a chance that we might be able to escape war in Nigeria if we use the PVC route. And how do I make? Remember I said earlier, that Nigeria is actually on a leadership recruitment drive. Mm. It's a leadership recruitment drive because we who are meant to be led, we need to be clear about where we want to be led Let to. You. It is in the clarity of demanding where we want to be led to that the leaders would emerge if they are leaders. As are today in the political space, there are two candidates. One has offered certainty as to his capacity to lead in that different direction. One has offered glimpses of a capacity, but he hasn't offered a plan. Yelisho Ore has clearly offered a plan as to the direction we should be traveling. But it's about timing. Peter Obi has not offered a plan and it is critical that we are traveling in the direction that forces the coup that I described. What is that coup? A Peter will be that manages to energize and unite the youth. Is capable of galvanizing an electoral revolution. We are more than them at any point in time. We are more than them. But Peter Obi has not offered us something to follow. Some of us are old dogs. We've been at this for too long. We are not fooled by rhetoric. We need to see a plan before we might follow any man. The illusions of 2014 did not carry us. So how would this one carry us? So what we are saying is this. If you want to use the electoral path, galvanize a movement that is capable of triggering a revolution. The people in Ekiti will sell their votes because they had nothing to look forward to. Nobody gave... Look, a vote that is useless, you already know that regardless of which one of them comes into power, nothing will change. They've not offered you a different path. Shegun Oni had a history of performance. The people could look to that. But when it came to the day of the election, with weaponized poverty See, and bad. the fact that the election was localized, it was easier for those who we rig, who had sucked up money all these years, instead of building roads, instead of building schools, instead of building hospitals, instead of building human capacity, they've sorted up the money because they know that it is easier for them to simply buy the votes of impoverished people. But that is because the people have not been offered something that they find more compelling than the 10,000 Naira. But, but, but doesn't that, what, I mean, it shows what Nigerians should expect come 2023. I mean, Look, I, I'll, I'll argue to also <laughs> expatiate on what you think the next election will be in relation to the credibility of the ballot boxes as well. Number one. Let's be clear about something. Eight months is a lifetime but in politics. Nah, <laughs> it's a lifetime in politics. It's a lifetime. Eight months is an entire lifetime in politics. That's one. Second thing is, everybody is still assuming that we would have an election. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been clear that I'm still not sure that there will be one. 
And I'm even still not sure that even if there is one, it is one that would engage our interest. It's all a function of whether we manage to recruit a worthy leader behind whom we might be able to kill. If we found a worthy leader to kill behind, it becomes possible to energize an electoral revolution. In the absence of that, one of the twin horsemen of the apocalypse, more, more likely, Etiku, would gain power. Because that would be in keeping with the hegemonic interest of those who have designed the disaster in which we live. If an Etiku comes to power, it will be more of the same. Maybe, not even maybe, he will certainly be a lot less violent towards Nigerians than a Buhari has been. But nothing will change. It would simply mean that Nigeria will continue to be logged into its current cycles because the problem really lies at the root of the iniquitous foundations and structures of Nigeria. If we do not address those issues, you can change any number of personnel. As long as you still have a structure with 36 states, 36 houses of assemblies, 36 chief justices, all these 774 local governments, a police structured to work on impunity, a state structured not to function under the rule of law. What you simply have, maybe a better tempered government, but it will still remain a government that is irresponsible to the people mm. and that is not answerable to them. As long as the law does not rule in Nigeria, which is essentially one of the demands that has led to the call for restructuring, you still have the same situation. You still have the same situation. So it's still going to be the same. Oh. Is your PVC or your gun? Because this won't end. So how do we avoid returning to this sorry situation come 2023? Does it mean there's no hope? <laughs> it is... Um, I believe a few weeks ago, I said the undertakers are coming. Hmm. And I spoke metaphorically to the interment of hope. Hmm. A lot of people are hopeful today, just as we were hopeful in the days of NSAS, when we hoped that something good might come out of that popular That's movement amazing. for change. A lot of people are hopeful. They are investing their hope in uh, Peter Obi, in yeah. uh, Yelisho Ore. People are investing their hope. Okay, talking about that, I, I crave your indulgence. Sorry to cut yeah. you short. Part, part of the arguments that have been put forth against uh, the candidature of uh, uh, Peter Obi and Yelisho Ore is the argument that they don't have the structure, so to speak. You, uh, you see, the English language came to die in Nigeria. I've said this severally. What do they mean by structure? They mean the capacity to buy votes, the capacity to buy police, the capacity to buy high neck, mm. the capacity to bring thugs. These are the structures to which they speak. And these are valid structures if you are playing the game by the rule of the game. I am of the opinion that if we don't change the game, we can't win. And that is why I keep saying that you have to galvanize a movement. In the Once you galvanize a movement for change, what then happens is that all these structures become useless because the people themselves are the structure. If democracy is meant to be built on citizenship, but there is voters' apathy, to the point where you had just under 28, no, just over 27 million people voting in the last oh, presidential the election oh. out of a voting population of around 90 million. It meant that you had less than a third of the population participating. And that is with the voters' inflation, underage voting, and everything, in, particularly in the northern part of Nigeria. 
you still had only 27 million. So it then means that you have a less than a third of the populace coming out to vote. Hmm. Now, if because the people have invested their hope in these new candidates, because the people have bothered to register to vote, because those who had not been voting in the past are likely to be voting in the coming election, it is not inconceivable that you might have as many as 50 to 60 million people voting in the next election. If you have that number coming out, and that would only happen if you galvanize people sufficiently. If you have that happening, the structures becomes irrelevant. How many thugs are they going to be deploying? How many people's votes are they going to buy? And then how do you operate with the impunity to, of vote buying in the open space if the people themselves are mobilized, if they understand what is at stake, if they are mobilized, if you have given them relatable basis to side with you, come on. I would, look, this same Ekiti was the state where people killed in defense of their votes because the vote meant something to them. They were just as hungry, if not impoverished, but they stood behind their vote. This time around, the vote means nothing because the ruining crash has offered them no choice. They know that the ritual of voting is empty. Is either they are voting and the police will stand aside when the thugs will come and scatter the place when they can't buy the vote. But when the people themselves are involved, when they are energized, galvanized, and mobilized into a movement for change, they will defend their vote. But at what point will this trajectory be led towards that. Let me ask you a question. The, How long did it take to gather? Nigerians are uh, not conscious enough at no, this point. No, 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 we, no, I mean, no, we, we no, saw what no, happened in AKT. No. I, I beg to disagree. I am, a, I, I am ordinarily an optimist. I believe in the inherent capacity of the Nigerian to understand the issues if they are explained to them. But we've tended to talk over their head. We've not offered them genuine choices. Mr. Peter Obi, for instance, is running away from alienating people so he cannot put his plan on the table. That failure to put the plan on the table makes it impossible to galvanize the movement he needs to galvanize. Today is the one they are all talking about because there is nothing to talk about on their side. They have no programs, nothing. The real candidates in this race, as far as I'm concerned, Peter Obi and Yele Shoure, as far as I'm concerned, those are the two candidates that me I see in this race with their relative strengths and weaknesses. But as far as I'm concerned as well, if we, who are the ones looking for change, are not clear about the kind of changes that we seek, it becomes impossible to embolden the candidates sufficiently to understand the direction in which they need to lead us. Nigeria is irreparably damaged under Buhari. You can only reimagine it and then sell the vision of that new Nigeria to Nigerians across the length and breadth of Nigeria. Not everybody would agree with that new vision. But I believe that sufficient numbers of Nigerians, particularly the youth. So when I tell you we have time, I know what I'm talking about. We have more than enough time. But if you are looking to lead people, you need to show them where you are leading them to. It's not sufficient to be talking from consumption to production. How? It's always a pleasure having this conversation. Thank you very much for having me.